Um, first and foremost, before I even get started, um, I just want to say um, many of you know me. I know I've seen names here that I recognize, um, but many of you don't, and, and maybe you don't even know about Idaho Parents Unlimited and who we are. So before we go into this, I just want to say Idaho Parents Unlimited is the statewide parent training and information center um, for families who have children with disabilities. And we're also the Family to Family Health Information Center for children, families and children who have special health care needs. And they, disabilities and special health, health care needs may be interchangeable for some. And in other cases, you know, they may, a family might not be um, thinking of their child with uh, maybe acute allergies or something, um, even with ADHD or those types of diagnoses as having a disability, but maybe are seeing specialists and have special health care needs. Uh, nevertheless, um, I think most important to our work is that we're a parent-led organization, which means we are both parents and professionals in this work. So we're navigating these systems and, and walking the walk and talking the talk. That uh, And so I could actually just sit here and listen and talk about this all day long <laughs> because it's, uh, it is definitely also near and dear to my heart, which is why I asked the question about genetics. Um, I also have a um, almost 27-year-old daughter who uh, had a uh, an unusual uh, pediatric a uh, journey of um, maybe autism, atypical Rett syndrome for many, many years until genetics finally caught up with her. And we continue to push and push for, I love Dr. Patterson, which you said those keys, um, finding those keys that work for her and our family until she could finally get diagnosed with her true genetic condition, which is not even got a syndrome name. It's HNR and PH2. Um, uh, she's just, uh, she was 80th in the world. So I feel, and that was only three years ago. So um, so I'm looking at this, this case in particular of autism and what else is going on and really listening to the parents in all of these situations when we know in our guts, there's more, there's something more here. Yes, there's this, and we want to work with this and intervene here, but then there's something more. And so, um, so thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you for that presentation. And I'm going to, I, uh, as I talked to Lindsay about this navigating family crisis, I thought, well, that's huge. <laughs> this is one of those enormous, um, buckets of, uh, of consideration when it comes to what is a crisis. So let's just go ahead and get right into the first slide and let's talk about um, what that might mean to um, what we're going to look at here. So we're going to talk about what a crisis might look like. Um, at, the, at the very end, I want to make sure to give resources, but I wanted to talk about crisis in the school setting and then also some changes that are happening within the state of Idaho um, to crisis services for both pediatrics and adults. Um, the reason why I bring up the school setting is because here at our office, in our office, um, frequently when a family is in crisis, a child is in crisis of, of some sort, it typically is also taking place within their school setting. So, um, and that needs to be addressed. So we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. All right. So here's all the questions. Um, what is a crisis? So Again, this is going to depend on the age of a child and what a crisis might look like. So for some families, as you all, many of you may know, we see kids who have um, an autism diagnosis who may be very early diagnosed and their crises are starting um, very early and it might look like um, struggle in um, even childcare settings. Maybe they are having uh, behaviors and they're being asked to leave um, childcare or even before they're in school. So a, child, a crisis as a child gets a little older when they hit those teen years, that's gonna look a lot different than when the parent maybe feels like, or the family feels like they have a little more control in their child's structure compared to when the child gets a little older. Um, do they have a co-occurring diagnosis? And frequently, as many of you know, these kids do. They often will have mental health diagnoses co-occurring. And so when we talk about resources for crisis, I think it's important to know that families are experiencing multiple systems that they're trying to work within 
to solve their problems or to intervene. And frequently those systems aren't necessarily speaking to each other. Um, so in our office, we'll take calls from families who have a child with both a developmental disability, autism per, uh, spectrum disorder, as well as perhaps uh, multiple mental health diagnoses. So I'll throw in the, the most common alphabet soups that we have in our office, kids who are also diagnosed with ADHD or oppositional defiance disorder or anxiety, um, where those behaviors are really manifesting um, frequently. Um, and then the types of behaviors that are coming into play. Are they, are they dangerous? Are they aggressive? Are they self-injurious? Or are they the types of behaviors that are um, less, less uh, intrusive, but equally as problematic or chronic for families? And that is one thing that I didn't put on here that I did think about quite a bit. I don't think that the families that call our office who are having kids or their family is in some sort of crisis, it is not a one-off. These are not situations that are just solved um, with some specific individual, you know, a therapy or they'll call our office. Well, what can I do? Who could we see? It, these are these are ongoing. If they if they're reaching a point of crisis, chances are it's going to be a chronic revolving door of trying to um, navigate these systems. And, and it can go on for many, many years, um, even with interventions and treatments. And so when we're working with families, we have to know that um, families are exhausted. They love their kids. They're hurting. <laughs> they live with fear. That projection, you know, that five years at a time, that's, I mean, as you're, if you're a parent, you know, one 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 scary situation is enough to send you into, oh my God, what's that going to look like? How are they going to live their lives? How are they going to function? How are we going to do any of this? And um, we're, we're constantly trying to work around the issue of let's get from breakfast to bedtime and stay intact. And, um, but recognizing that they're not one-offs. They are, and, and they may they wax and wane, right? I mean, these situations, we might see progress. We're going to get a little better. Typically, there's a, a lot of communication involved where communication is, you know, communication is behavior. We know that. So what is the child trying to communicate that they're not able to? I love Deb's uh, example of, you know, here we are dealing with a, um, a real GI issue that we see that a lot that's exhibiting, you know, that's turning into behaviors that can be uh, anxiety, self-injurious, all of these other things that really have nothing to do with the condition itself, but the underlying other conditions that are happening. <clears throat> so um, we really do need to look at what types of behaviors are being are, are exhibited um, before a plan can really be developed. The other part is has it escalated? Has this happened before? Has it escalated? What interventions worked before? Um, and then if there is a crisis plan in place, has it been successful? And if not, do we revisit it? If there's no crisis plan in place, maybe this is the first time we're seeing something like this. How do we help a, how do we help a family begin to plan for crisis and or safety in their homes? And then again, in the community and, and school settings. So let's go on to the next slide. Okay, so, so that being said, let's talk about school. So we know that um, the vast majority of um, the, the vast majority of the families that we talk to call us first because they are experiencing a situation within the school setting. They are calling us because their child has been exhibiting behaviors. And I'm not even joking when I tell you I got a call from a parent at six o'clock last night with this situation. And um, I have somebody scheduled to talk to her at four today. So this is not uncommon at all. And the question also was, uh, does Idaho not have any treatment facilities that my child can go to? This is out of control. We've done this so many times. This is happening too much. This is, this is crisis. The family might not even be identifying that this is crisis for them, but it's, it, they're at a crisis point. When they're asking the question, where can I go? Where can I send them? I don't know what else to do at home. We're exhausted. There are siblings in the home. We don't, and now they're suspended from school 
again, right? So that's crisis. And we see this as young as six, seven, eight years old. We see um, uh, disciplinary action, including charges being filed against children at that young. We see police involvement. We see um, we see every scenario you can imagine. And a, a family typically isn't, when they're faced with this, they are not necessarily even recognizing that they're in crisis. They're trying to solve today's problem. Um, and so just really, really taking that family perspective um, into account when, when working with these situations is super important. Um, so we ask that we triage our families with these with these types of uh, questions. If they're facing disciplinary action, first and foremost, does this child are they receiving special education? Do they already have an IEP in place? Um, if they do, have they ever conducted a, a functional behavioral assessment as part of that? And a lot of times they haven't, especially depending on the age of the child. If they didn't exhibit these behaviors early on, maybe they were dealing with an IEP that was focused on um, you know, communication goals, but they weren't exhibiting behaviors, but now they're getting a little older and we're starting to see some more um, behaviors in the classroom that are, are um, becoming aggressive or just against uh, school-wide policies. So how do we, how do we intervene with, a, with an FBA? And we will walk families through that process. If anybody is not familiar with that, we will help them know how to request an FBA and we'll walk them through what that might look like um, and how that gets done in the school setting. And then how does a behavior intervention plan get um, put into place? And what does it look like? We are always hopeful that our schools are um, working with positive behavioral interventions and supports, PBIS, and so that they know that those uh, behavior plans can have, um, you know, you're looking at the what's triggering the behavior, what can we do to intervene, and then what are the positive interventions that we do to hopefully prevent those behaviors from either taking place or, or escalating. Um, if that behavioral intervention plan looks like a discipline plan, then it's probably not a positive behavior plan. So that, and don't get me wrong, there is a time and a place for a discipline plan. I um, have a, a different child, another child. My kids are all adults now, so I can um, share only so much, but my youngest does give me permission to share her story from when she was younger. Um, she, we did have a discipline plan in place for her where she was um, dealing with uh, some, some ongoing issues with, with theft. And so by the time she got in high school, she did need to uh, take a, a responsibility for some of that. So there is a time and a place for that, but typically, in this regard, you're talking about behavior intervention plans. And if the behavior intervention plan is not being followed and then behaviors are escalating, there's a process to deal with that crisis. If the behavioral intervention plan is being followed and yet things are escalating and we're seeing new behaviors, then it's time to have the IEP team meet and revisit a new FBA, and really look at either new triggers or and or new interventions to to uh, to assist this child. So that there is the the short and uh, quick version of uh, what happens in a school setting. Um, I will add to this a couple things. Um, if there are if there is disciplinary action, I think a lot of times people think that a child with a disability can't be disciplined, or they can't be suspended, or they can't be expelled. None of that is true. They, they absolutely can. Um, however, there are very specific uh, rules in place for kids with disabilities and as far as disciplinary action goes and what that would look like. So if, um, if anybody wants more information on that, please feel free to contact me or our office and we can kind of give you the, the rundown of what, what that looks like in um, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act and then how to proceed if that's the case, which is not an, also an uncommon call in our office. We get those calls um, on a routine basis where kids are being expelled or um, facing uh, alternative placements and um, how does that look? So uh, that's our role. If you're, if you're ever, how, where do I go? Who do I turn to for these school issues? 
I pull is your, we're, we're your people. We're charged to do that. That's our job. And, and just so you know, we do all of this for families at no cost. So, and, and for you all too. So feel free to call us. Let's go to the next slide. All right. So this is for homes. Very, very similar to at school. We teach parents how to put all of those same things into place at home. We offer a training as well. I think I saw in the chat, I'm not reading it as I go, but I think I saw the word SESTA, Idaho SESTA, which is um, the special education support and technical assistance for school districts. They have plenty of tools and resources for parents as well. So please feel free to check them out there on the Idaho Training Clearinghouse. And I'm not sure if I included that in my, in my end of uh, presentation resources, but I can get that for folks. Um, but we, we teach parents how to put a behavior and crisis plan in place at home because it's going to look different. Our kids all act different at home than they do at school, by and large. And so the way we manage things in our homes is very different than the way perhaps it's being managed in the school. But those strategies and interventions can be generalized across settings. So we want to know if they've got a safety plan in place. Do you have first responders involved on a regular basis? There are tools for this. There are ways to communicate with first responders or any of a community crisis team or anybody who you think might be, um, you might be a frequent flyer. We have some families that are definitely frequent flyers that the, the you know, first responders know this family, they know them well, they know the home, they know what they need to do to de-escalate a situation. Um, and then we have others that have never even faced any of this and things can go awry quickly. So um, I've given in our resources area, I've given resources on safety plans, um, how to develop those, there's toolkits in the resources. Uh, and then most importantly, what method of communication does the child use? So if this is a nonverbal child and they are escalating, somebody needs to know how to communicate what that child is trying to communicate themselves or how they best communicate, whether that be through AAC or sign language or, um, you know, I, if you're escalating in a crisis, do they have um, do they have tools that they're using already to say, I feel this, or I'm feeling, you know, I'm, ex I'm experiencing this. Um, yes, I'm willing to share all my information, by the way. So, um, I shouldn't look at the chat while I'm trying to talk. I'll get off track. So, um, I, I will say, so I, I bring back my oldest daughter, the one that has the genetic condition. She's not, she's not nonverbal anymore. She's actually quite verbal, but she speaks in a gestalt language. Um, processing man manner. So everything she says is in the in a question form the way we ask her. So you can imagine if a child is in crisis and they're saying, what is the matter to you? Because that's what she says. What is the matter? And we don't know what is the matter. <laughs> it, that can that can only if you don't know how to respond to that, then that can escalate the situation too. So really knowing what method of communication this child uses um, at again at any age is key to being to de-escalate. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. Most common, um, unfortunately, I brought in this court and crisis services. So I want to talk about out of home, out of home placements, um, out of home uh, treatment or treatment facilities. Um, when I say that these calls come in frequently, I want to tell you. I think it was two years ago, I was in a meeting and somebody told me, and I believe this was in 2020, it could have been 2021, but either way, it was during it, it was during the whole, you know, we're during in the in the heart of the pandemic is what we were dealing with still right a lot of lockdown, a lot of things, not the same as not routine, not structured. I was told that the Department of Health and Welfare that year, the developmental disabilities case managers had received 91 calls from children's, from parents of children's DD services looking for out-of-home placements. That was a staggering number to me, um, considering I, I guess I sort of kind of expect that a little bit more from our mental health side, where kids are dealing with a mental health crisis. 
uh, I didn't anticipate it as much in the DD services. However, when you know there is that co-occurring co um, mental health and developmental disabilities that ha happens frequently, especially in an autism diagnosis, I guess it's, but it still seems like a very high number to me. But that just tells us that kids aren't necessarily getting, well, families aren't getting the supports that they need if they are at a point of desperately seeking out-of-home treatments. And when we know those are far and few between in our state and kids then have to go out of state and then even getting that approved is uh, really hard to do. Um, it means that families are living in a daily state of crisis with nowhere to turn on a daily, you know, every day. Um, and that's, that's scary for everybody involved. So I bring in the court and crisis services because I'm still told frequently that this is the go-to. This is where people um, make the calls for crisis and, uh, and this is where families can start to get some assistance when they're not getting assistance any other way. Um, that's the only reason why I'm bringing this in here because it's unfortunately the reality of some of what families are, are dealing with in our state. You can see here at the end that it says crisis assistance is available Monday through Friday, eight to five. So don't have a crisis after five because um, that isn't going to help you. <laughs> um, the, I, do, I do provide this resource in my resource slides as well, but I want to give you some good news. Let's go to the next slide. So here's the changes that are potentially um, being proposed to come to Idaho's crisis services. Right now, to find this information on the department's website, you will only find it in uh, um, adult services, adult mental health services, and I believe adult developmental disabilities. However, it is um, for pediatrics as well. And there used to be a contact, you used to have an easy contact to find on the developmental disabilities um, program for children as well for DD crisis, and that's no longer easy to find. I couldn't find it on the website, to be honest. Um, so uh, I actually had a parent ask somebody at the department, where is it? And then they realized it was missing from the site and they're moving it back. So, mm -hmm. so those crisis services for developmental disability services, the numbers and contact information should be hopefully soon put back on the department's website. Um, again, our office is a, a place to call and we'll dig this for, we'll do the digging for parents. They, they don't need to, they gotta get to breakfast to bedtime. So, um, one more thing is not what they need to deal with. But the start model is the, um, the new uh, approach that is coming to the state. And it's my understanding that it is going to be a statewide model. The Idaho Council on Developmental Disabilities has the most information on this. And they actually just did two webinars on this last week. So, um, I did give them, their, their link is in the resources as well. So if you want to know about how this is going to roll out, um, the DD Council is the one working directly with the department on this, uh, this approach. So let's go to the next slide for a little more info on it. Um, this is what the, the, um, the webinar that they gave, the slides that they had included some of this information. And you'll note at the end, it will be, there will be 24-hour emergency on-call staff. And so there's the eight to five crisis time. You can, you can actually have a crisis after hours. So that's good for everybody to have a resource there. Um, and then of course it will be for ages six and older. So it's not just limited to adults. So um, this is a, a team approach and highly trained professionals to provide these interventions specifically for when a family or an individual is in crisis. So, and it does say quality mental health and crisis services, but again, um, this is also for developmental disabilities. So let's go to the next slide. All right, um, so their key points are these. Obviously we wanna prevent crisis when possible. Going back to what I said in the beginning, unfortunately, um, crisis can be a revolving, uh, a, a revolving door. The goal of course is to try to uh, de-escalate as sooner than later, um, prevent more than we see, um, and have them not take to escalate to the point of people looking for those out-of-home placements or worse, having first responders or um, uh, people being injured in any way, shape, or form. 
um, that that is the the goal in all of this. Um, and then knowing where to find resources, of course, working on those every child's strengths and needs is super important. Um, and coming at everything from a strength-based standpoint is certainly my my philosophy. Find find that child's strengths and and then look for those underlying things. What are what it, we've got to listen to the child. We've got to listen to the parents. We have to know when something else is going on and. Usually it's not just because people want to, um, people don't want their children to be hospitalized. People don't want their children to be in out of home placements. Nobody is looking for that because they're bored um, or because they just don't wanna do this anymore. I think everybody wants to do what's best to help their kids be as healthy and happy and productive as possible. Um, and so finding their, finding their strengths and their needs and, and intervening when we can is critical. Let's go to the next slide. I'm trying to watch the time. I know I have just a minute. So I wanted to point out these references real quick. Um, there are a couple of things here, just some articles that I wanted to give you. The first one is crisis management in children with autism and then also dealing with first responders. The next two are toolkits. Uh, the first one is from the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. So I brought this in because there's several toolkits there. There's the safety toolkits, but it is from the perspective of the autistic individual. So, um, you know, nothing about us without us. It's their, it's their perspective. It's a great toolkit. The next one, planning for a crisis, the challenging behaviors toolkit comes from Autism Speaks. I think there's good information in here. I know that Autism Speaks, some people don't care for Autism Speaks and some people do. So you take what you, what's good for you. Um, but there is some uh, good information in there around Challenge Behaviors Toolkit. One resource I didn't put here that I meant to, um, and it might not be on our website, but if you want it, we stole a resource from the um, Ohio Department of Education several years ago that we really like. And it is a toolkit on what to do when your child is dealing with dangerous behaviors. And so uh, there's a lot of Ohio specific resources within it, but I, I really love the fact that it's written in a very parent friendly language and it's a great toolkit. So if you want more on that, I've got it. Um, here's the more information on the start model and everything that you want to know about that. And then I've got another page of resources. Let's go to the next page. And then here we have the court and crisis services that I talked about to learn more about that. Um, functional behavioral assessments and behavioral intervention plans. Understood.org is one of our favorites. Um, and then IPOL, that's us. And then the DD Council's website is there too. Um, there, we also have a lot of uh, resources in our office around positive behavioral interventions and supports. And one that we use as a go-to for parents that I didn't put on here that you might just want to write down because it's my favorite is pbisworld.com. This is not a U.S. Department of Education website. It's just it's a it just happens to be a great tool, and it gives you um, you choose the behavior. And then you click on the behavior and then it said, shows the behavior and says, does this sound like the child? You say yes. And it gives you tier one interventions. Have you tried this for a while? Yes, no, uh, try it some more. <laughs> try, if you haven't, if you need to go to tier two, go to tier two. What do they look like? You can click on them individually. So anyway, it's a great, it's a great website for um, folks who are trying to provide some input on a behavior plan perhaps with their schools, but also to use at home. And boy, that was a fire hose. 